with processed foods, what's on the ingredients is pretty much bad enough right there. <laughs> but in many cases, there's a right. lot of stuff that's not on the ingredient lists. So some versions of bread will list iodized dough conditioners. And researchers about, boy, a decade ago, they were already skeptical about that being the sole source of iodine in bread. And so they did some studies looking at bread and separated out those that listed either iodized salt and or iodized dough conditioners and those that did not. And they just assayed the iodine content in commercial bread. And it often had a lot. We talked about like somewhere around 200 micrograms per day is probably a safe upper limit for someone who's susceptible to too much. Well, you can find bread to where one slice contains 1,100 micrograms. Mm. That's a lot. And whether, yeah. Right. And whether or not there's anything pointing towards high down in the label, it's just not predictive. So there's a lot of stuff in processed food that's not even captured on the labeling. I'd like to take a moment to thank one of the sponsors of the show. And let me tell you, the Apollo wearable is amazing. And I have to say, I am really not into wearables, but this thing, I'm obsessed with it. In fact, I, I thought I threw it in the wash and was ready to buy another one immediately. I am obsessed with this. It improves the way your body manages stress. The Apollo wearable helps you sleep, stay calm, focus. I've actually been using them in interviews. So if you see, I originally was wearing it on my wrist and now I wear it on my ankle. This thing really allows me to stay focused. You basically feel a vibratory sensation and it helps regulate your nervous system, recover, rebalance from stress. There are different programs. You go to your iPhone and I use social and open all the time. Safe, natural, amazing, no side effects. Like I said, you can wear it on your wrist or ankle. You can now clip it on your clothing, but I'm telling you, wear it on your wrist, wear it on your ankle. You can get $40 off the Apollo wearable at ApolloNeuro.com slash Dr. Lion. That's ApolloNeuro.com slash Dr. Lion. Apollo's effects have been proven in multiple clinical trials, which I love, and these are real world studies. Some people experience 40% less stress and feelings of anxiety and 19% more time in deep sleep. I promise you guys will absolutely love this. Check it out. Let me know what you think. Dr. Alan Christensen, it is so good to see you, my friend. Uh, good to be with you, Dr. Gabrielle. Any excuse to hang out is, is a good one. <laughs> yes, and we've actually known each other for, gosh, years now. Bunch of years. It's been quite some time, yeah. Yeah, it has. I've been so fortunate to learn a lot from you, quite frankly. You know, I really value your input and insight as it relates to thyroid health, thyroid disease, which is a hot topic, probably now more than ever. You've been doing this how long? So you're a naturopathic physician, yep. which is a little different than some of the other guests. However, I have to say, I find you incredibly well-read, well-studied, and you've been in practice and have guided physicians and clinicians for decades. Not that you're that old. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I've, I've earned the grade that I got going. <laughs> it's uh, very distinguished. So um, I would love to hear your perspective in terms of why we are seeing more thyroid disease, which is arguably at an all-time high. It's at an all-time high. You know, it's a odd combination. So the rates of disease are increasing. You know, more folks have it than before. And this is true for chronic adult thyroid disease and thyroid cancer. And then the other issue is that those who have it, surveys show they're not managed well, so they're really struggling. And mm -hmm. thyroid meds are among the top one or two of all time prescribed medications globally. So this is a big thing. You know, why there's more of it? There's a certain amount that's probably just genetic and tied to gender, but the biggest single controllable variable has been iodine exposure. And for a lot of people, they can't tolerate too much, but they're getting exposed to more and more. You know, iodine exposure, remember the iodinized salt that we all have had or still do have? Uh, was that in relation to the time where we started to see an increase in thyroid disease? And, and actually, even before we talk about thyroid disease, can you kind of lay out the landscape for um, hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, subclinical hypothyroidism, so the listener can really get a good perspective of what we're talking about when we talk about thyroid disease? 
Yeah, so the thyroid's a little thing that controls how we burn energy, how we repair our tissues, and how well our nerves communicate. So it does a lot. And, you know, things can go wrong in the body. So it can have abnormal structure. That's going to be thyroid cancer, nodules, or goiter. It can have inflammation, and that's more so autoimmune thyroid disease. And that inflammation may lead to changes in hormone output. There can be too much, which we call hyperthyroidism, or too little, which we call hypo. And hypo, there are various levels of that. Some we know cause symptoms and we know can benefit from medication. That's called overt hypothyroidism. And there's other levels that are not that far along. They may cause symptoms. They may or may not benefit from medication. And those include subclinical hypothyroidism and what's been called suboptimal hypothyroidism. Hmm. And how would someone know that they have this? Any of these. Well, yeah, if they've already been diagnosed, that's obvious. Most people have not been diagnosed. So structural problems, the most common of those are thyroid nodules. And the risk of a thyroid nodule, oddly, is almost the same as someone's age in years. Hmm. So if you're 50 years old, you 50-50 chance of having a nodule. They're very common. The functional and the inflammatory diseases, the more someone has unexplained symptoms, the more they should consider those to be options. And some symptoms are more commonly tied than others. Any that involve changes in how you swallow, how you speak, tight sensations, those are ones that are suspicious. Uh, Unresolved fatigue, weight struggles, you know, someone to where they only lose weight with extreme diets, it comes right back. A lot of menstrual irregularities, so those can tie into that too. And then hair thinning. So those are the big ones. But yeah, if there's unresolved symptoms or known disease, someone's in that category. Um, and I see that all the time in clinic. Fertility issues, massive fatigue, hair falling out, and weight gain, of course, which uh, is often what most commonly people think about in terms of thyroid You mentioned something earlier. You said one of the biggest causes, of course, there are genetic components, but is uh, something very subtle that I think is not discussed often, and that's iodine. If you could, no, this is so weird. We've got a we've got a general sense about nutrients doing things in the body and how they play out, and our general sense about that is accurate for almost all nutrients. Vitamin C is a great one. You know, we we need some. If we get less than a speck, we get a specific disease called scurvy. And there may be amounts that, that definitely there's amounts above which offset scurvy that can produce better health outcomes. You know, there's optimal amounts that are above that threshold. And the toxicology of it is such to where it's not realistically, realistically a concern for nearly anyone. The amounts you would get from diet or regular supplementation, it's not going to be harmful. And yeah, that's true for most nutrients in general, but it's just not true for iodine. So we all have a similar requirement based on our body size but our tolerance is very different. There, there's some genes that control that, and there's two different patterns for iodine tolerance for people. Um, that's really fascinating. Do you routinely test gene expression or um, those genetic SNPs related to iodine? You know, it's a great question, and it's a tricky thing because there's having a gene and there's having a gene act in a certain way, and they don't always overlap. So, yeah, we know which genes are more susceptible, but you could have the genes and not have a problem, and some people can have a problem and not necessarily have the obvious genes. So I actually don't test for that. It's relevant if someone is known to have thyroid disease. If someone doesn't have thyroid disease, they still could be at risk for excess exposure. So yeah, if someone knows that they've got the disease, we know they've got one of the variants that makes more uh, less tolerance of extra iodine. It's really interesting when we think about iodine because I, uh, it's put in our foods, and, and arguably they did that for a reason. It was, that was to prevent some kind of iodine deficiency as it relates to we don't live by the ocean or some individuals don't live by the ocean, and they're thinking, okay, well, where are we going to get iodine? What's your perspective on that? You know, the ocean's a great point. All iodine comes from that. So there's there's pediatric structural disease and there's adult functional disease. And the bizarre thing is that the most extreme deficits of iodine manifest in pediatric structural disease, especially goiter or thyroid enlargement. However, if you heavy-handedly correct that, you can easily push a certain percent of the population to be more prone into adult structural disease. Yeah, the narrow between how much you need and how much is too much for some people is really, really narrow. Hmm. So what do you tell people 
that have thyroid disease, or let's just say, what is the most common? What is the most common thyroid disease? Yeah, so in all those things about function and structure, the most typical scenario that calls into someone into clinical presence, like they, they seek out help for that, is going to be some underactivity of the thyroid and some relevant symptoms. That's almost always from autoimmunity, from Hashimoto's. And in those cases, many have an opportunity to improve their disease or even reverse it by getting below a certain iodine threshold. So in one sense, it's always nice to know why things happen, but knowing the cause doesn't always reverse the problem. Like I know. In the case I was of just gender. thinking about that as, ob as it relates to obesity, right? Sure. Yeah, we know that women are, are six to 10 times more apt to get thyroid disease. So gender is a big cause, but that doesn't open up a treatment option. You know, <laughs> your Yeah, so, but this is one to where it does. So many can actually reverse it after it started. Hmm. And one way to reverse thyroid disease or hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's is a reduction in iodine. You know, there's been a couple of studies that gave results pretty similar to what I'll mention now. And they took people that had rather advanced disease and they, they weren't on any kind of medical treatment, but they were being monitored. And for about four years, they had been at a quite advanced state and staying there. And the one thing they did was had them on an iodine regulated diet. And over the course of eight to 12 weeks per the study, somewhere between about like 60 to 80% of them were just like totally cured. Like everything was gone. They were totally normal again. And that by itself is a pretty big deal because we didn't think that thyroid disease at that level would reverse for adults. So the first thing is it showed that it did, which was huge. Now, 60 to 80%, that's a big win right there. You know, I'd be happy with that. But of those who were in the groups that didn't respond, most of them were in one of two categories. Either they did respond, but they didn't get yet all the way better. You know, they were heading that way, but they weren't there yet by the end of that eight to 12 weeks. Or they just weren't compliant. You know, and when they look back at how well they followed the guidelines, they just weren't following the guidelines. Mm. So of those who really did follow the guidelines and didn't respond at all, that was between about three to 5% per study. So it's a bold claim that about 95% of people can improve their thyroid function by just that one little thing. I think that that is very, very bold and interesting. Obviously, um, the totality of evidence over a period of time will be very valuable. When it comes to when you said it improves thyroid function when they were on a iodine limited diet or at least iodine restricted for that individual, did it improve the antibody markers? Did it lower the antibody markers or did it improve TSH? Did it improve free T4? How did they measure those outcomes? Yeah, the studies varied, but many of the individuals were overtly hypothyroid, meaning they had elevated TSH and suppressed T4. One study focused solely on those that had known autoimmunity. Another study didn't segregate, but it did have about half of the participants with known autoimmunity. So yeah, they've reversed the autoimmunity. The thyroid antibodies either normalized or came close to it. And TSH scores, one study had an average of 14.1. Another study had an average of just about 22, like 21.8. 21.9, I forgot. But in both those cases, their average scores came down to the three range in the course of just a, just those, those few months. And yeah, regulation of T4 and T3, improvement of antibodies. So all those things got radically better. I'd like to thank one of the sponsors of the show, Paleo Valley. I love Paleo Valley. Not only do I love them as people, I absolutely love their products. I will never forget when I was in LA, I was running from podcast to podcast, absolutely starving. I'm sure you guys have experienced being on the run. And my friend Chase had stuck Paleo Valley beef sticks in my bag and was like, trust me, you'll want these for later. This is amazing. And man, was he right. Their beef sticks are 100% grass fed, grass finished. And um, they're sourced from small domestic farms in the U.S. They ferment all their sticks, which creates this naturally occurring prebiotic kind of probiotic compound within the beef stick. But it also changes the texture. So the texture of these beef sticks really specifically is absolutely amazing. If you can get 15% off if you go to paleovalley.com slash Dr. Lion, enter the code Dr. Lion, and you can try not only their beef sticks, but they're bars. They have so many amazing products. They have organ supplements if you're not into eating liver. So go to paleovalley.com slash Dr. Lion, enter the code Dr. Lion, and you will get 15% off. If you are hesitant on what to purchase, you don't know, 
definitely, definitely start with the beef sticks or even the turkey. I mean, the, the stuff is absolutely amazing. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I, I really love this product and I really love this company. So check them out. Just out of curiosity, how did you make the connection? Because you know in what? traditional, not to interrupt you, but in, in no, no, it's good. You know, in the kind of natural realm of medicine, a lot of individuals were using iodine to treat hypothyroidism. Yeah, that's how I made the connection. So, <laughs> I was exposed to those ideas way back when. The person who founded them has since passed away, but I was directly I can talk to him directly. I read all of his work. And there was an argument that there was this massing, this massive deficiency of iodine that was being missed. And I found it persuasive, but when I really looked at the references and read a lot of things myself about that in primary sources, I didn't find the evidence compelling. There was a lot of contrary data, but that pushed me into studying more about this. And for many years, I was aware of the fact that too much could be a problem. But I didn't think too much past that. You know, those that I was treating and managing, I would encourage them to, you know, not do these mega doses and to avoid those. But I didn't yet know that lowering it was also an opportunity. But just by following so much medical literature on the topic, I stumbled across these studies showing that, that yeah, too much was a bad thing, but too little could also be a very good thing. And did you begin to implement that into your own practice? Immediately. And yeah, the results were, were great. Already, I had been cautious about avoiding a lot of common sources. For example, I'd always encourage those with thyroid disease to use vitamins that didn't have iodine to avoid it in those sources. But when I learned about uh, the fact that lowering below a threshold could be therapeutic, I also learned about a lot of hidden sources of it. And so I got more diligent about avoiding more of those with people. And yeah, we we have just Every day, every week, we have many case stories of those whose disease is reversed. They may have been on meds for decades and had all these problems, and now they're totally cured. That's gotten rather common. That must be very fulfilling for you, you know. Um, what are some of the foods or uncommon sources of iodine that an individual perhaps with hypothyroidism or and or Hashimoto's should avoid? Yeah, so some of the apparent sources are going to be like iodine salt or sea vegetables or iodine in supplements. The hidden ones, there's a lot of salt that's not iodized, but still has a bunch of iodine. Uh, pink hamaleon has gotten quite popular. I've seen conflicting assays, but I have seen some suggesting that it has more iodine per serving than iodized salt does. So yeah, there are many types of salt that are free of iodine, but some of the ones that don't say iodized are not in that list. So that can be hidden or conflicting. One thing that surprised me a lot was topical products. So this came under attention in 2018. The FDA had run some studies looking at rates of thyroid disease in proportion to iodine excretion in healthcare workers. And at that time, a lot of the hand sanitizers were iodine-based, or they included iodine as an antiseptic. And they saw that in proportion of sanitizer usage, people had more iodine exposure and greater onset of thyroid disease. So they banned its use in hand sanitizers. Now, I read about that and I thought, well, but what other sources are there? And I kept digging around and I realized that there's some things, there's some kind of goop where we put a lot of it in our body and it stays there. And the biggest ones I thought about were like, you know, conditioner or body lotions or face creams. There's tons of cosmetics that we don't use in that large of volumes, or they may not absorb completely like we wash them off quickly. But those categories are ones to where we use a lot and they stay on. And I found that, you know, iodine is a very useful compound. It's a, it's a great antiseptic. It prevents things from getting rancid easily. It makes creams stay smooth and mix up well and not get all clumpy and whatnot. So it's quite useful in making many things. But there's versions of it that are very popular in both natural and commercial cosmetics. And I realized that the amounts that we use, even after you factor in that, you know, the whole conditioner is not all this one iodine ingredient, that's, that's a fraction of it. And that iodine ingredient is not purely iodine. And not all of what goes on the skin absorbs right away. So factoring all these things in, you could take a shower, use a conditioner, and walk out with 10 times your, your day's safe exposure to iodine just from your conditioner. Hmm. So what you're saying is people should not wash or condition their hair. Just kidding. It's an out for everybody <laughs> uh, in case you didn't like personal hygiene. <laughs> that becomes a bit terrifying 
would you recommend that people look at the back of their labels? And are there certain um, code words for iodine if it's not um, doesn't specifically say iodine on the back of a label? It's, it's it's worth looking, and you're right, it won't say iodine per se. The most common two things it would say would be PVD, P PVP, which is polyvinyl pyridone. Uh, there's other names for that, but that's the most common. Now, natural products use the same thing, but they call that kelp extract or seaweed extract. But those are the most common forms of it to see on a cosmetic label. And then in terms of food, there's a lot of controversy around thyroid and food intake, hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, autoimmune, and we hear it in the, the media all the time. The big ones are cruciferous vegetables. Curious as to what your thoughts are on that. Gluten. People say, okay, well, um, I have Hashimoto's. I should go gluten-free. Also dairy. Dairy is uh, a source of iodine. I don't know where it falls in terms of on the spectrum compared to, say, seafood or a uh, sea vegetable. But I would love to hear your thoughts on this. You know, people want to make a difference and people want natural solutions. And there's a ton of folks with thyroid disease that are not happy. So they're looking for answers. So if you do research about like, you know, foods and thyroid disease, you'll see topics come up about goitrogens and you'll see talk about cruciferous vegetables. And this is something that's relevant, but not in the context of which we're talking about now. This is not relevant for adults with thyroid disease in the modern world. They are relevant to there's now seven countries that are moderately iodine deficient, no countries that are severely iodine deficient. So the seven that are moderately deficient, goitrogens can be relevant to the pediatric rate of structural thyroid disease. So yeah, they can't consume massive amounts of those types of cruciferous vegetables, you know, broccoli, bok choy. There's no relevance to adult chronic functional thyroid disease with goitrogens, however. The other things you mentioned... These have come about from either anecdotal stories or their ideas that were very plausible and were entertained in medical literature, but didn't always persist. So gluten was one to where many noticed the high overlap between celiac disease and thyroid disease. And a fair question about, you know, 17 years ago was maybe in those with celiac disease, maybe their exposure to wheat caused them to get thyroid disease. And before we knew more, there was a lot of ways in which that was, that was plausible. There were some mechanisms by which that could have happened. But some big studies were done in which they looked at people that were newly diagnosed with celiac. And because of the overlaps, many of them already had thyroid disease. So they were taken out. So everybody who just got diagnosed who did not have thyroid disease was tracked for a year. And over that year, they segregated them based upon who was compliant and who was not. And there's some immune markers that can show that. And the thought was that they wanted to know if their gluten exposure was triggering thyroid disease. And if it was, those who were compliant, fewer of them should develop thyroid disease than those who are not compliant. And it about the opposite showed up. There was actually a few more cases in those who were non-compliant. Now, they should be compliant for overall health, and it wasn't protective for them to have eaten gluten. But if it was causative, it should have showed fewer cases in that group. And the contingency about gluten-causing thyroid disease in the general population was always based upon the effects in those with celiac. So yeah, in those who were most vulnerable, it didn't happen. And other studies have showed similar things. Now, anecdotally, a lot of folks have said they've cut various things in their diet and seen that improve their thyroid. And for quite some time, it did puzzle me because there was theories about, like you said, like dairy, uh, gluten, or a lot of other a lot of other food ingredients that some thought mattered for them that there was really not a clear reason why it would have helped. And maybe even controlled studies show that it didn't make a difference. But yet there was these stories about it helping. And what I realized is that many of these things that have taken on this status of being useful, they're often really high sources of iodine. So of our main dietary sources, most have been rather static, meaning the amount of that food category we eat hasn't changed a lot in the recent past. And the amount of iodine in that food has not changed a lot in the recent past. But 23 of the 25 top dietary sources of iodine come from processed grains and dairy products. And the amount of the processed grains that we've consumed over the recent decades has increased. And the amount of iodine in 23 out of those 25 foods has gone up by two or three fold over the last few decades. So yeah, a lot of folks could have gone gluten-free or, and or dairy-free and radically plummeted their iodine intake and not knowing that that was what might have been helpful. Ah, oh, that's interesting. Basically, 
you're not really saying that it's the gluten being the problem at all. It's more of how it's processed and um, if it's even added. Is, is, right. is iodine naturally occurring in these processed foods? You know, it's in everything quite literally, but some foods just have categorically much higher amounts than others. So it's not naturally occurring in high amounts in grain, nor is it naturally occurring in high amounts in dairy. In the case of dairy, it's used as a teat sanitizer and also an antioxidant. And then also there can be things like fish meal added into cow's diets. So a lot of it ends up in ways that it wouldn't have to, but it does. And then processed grain products. This has been a fascinating story because, you know, people like you and I, we think a lot about what's on the ingredients, what's going in there. And I've seen many examples to where with processed foods, what's on the ingredients is pretty much bad enough right there. (laughs) But in many cases, there's a lot of stuff that's not on the ingredient lists. So some versions of bread will list iodized dough conditioners. And researchers about, boy, a decade ago, they were already skeptical about that being the sole source of iodine in bread. And so they did some studies looking at bread and separated out those that listed either iodized salt and or iodized dough conditioners and those that did not. And they just assayed the iodine content in commercial bread. And it often had a lot. We talked about like somewhere around 200 micrograms per day is probably a safe upper limit for someone who's susceptible to too much. Well, you can find bread to where one slice contains 1,100 micrograms. That's a lot. And whether, yeah. Right. And whether or not there's anything pointing towards high down on the label, it's just not predictive. So there's a lot of stuff in processed food that's not even captured on the labeling. So I suppose the next logical question would be, how do you actually test iodine in the blood there, uh, or actually in urine? So a, a urinary iodine spot test. That's a really logical question. And we have to think about tests in terms of, you know, are they... Are they, are they accurate at a population level, at an individual level? Are they clinically relevant? So iodine is something to where it's metabolized really quickly. A lot of it is stored in inactive form, and it's got very different concentrations within certain compartments, primarily the thyroid. So a first question is, you know, what's the relationship of iodine in the urine or the blood to that of the thyroid? And at the most extremes, it certainly does relate, but not in a way that's relevant at almost all clinical levels. So urine tests are very accurate tools for population's iodine status, but they've looked so much at how individuals' levels of urine iodine can predict their nutritional status of iodine. And they do if you test over and over and over again. So like a minimal threshold is about 10 tests, and that can put you within about 80% accuracy. One test test. doesn't, no. And if you want to get to within like 95% accuracy, you're talking about testing every day for a year. I mean, no exaggerations, over 300 tests. So then there's serum iodine and that's readily accessible. Doctors are sending patients off for a blood draw for the thyroid markers already. It seems easy to check the box for iodine. Now the blood iodine does correlate with iodine toxicology. What that means is the body generally excretes extra iodine via the kidneys and the urine, but there's a point at where if there's so much, it cannot do that. At that point, iodine starts to oxidize within the kidneys, within the liver, and it becomes it can become fatal at, at some level. So when you can't pee out anymore, then it starts to elevate in your blood. So if you have a patient who was on a medicine like amiodarone, or they had a CT contrast with a big dose of iodine, and now you're two, three, four months later, and they're developing thyroid disease or other complications that are suggestive of iodine exposure, and you're wondering, hey, could that stuff back then still be clunking around in their body? That's where a toxicology test of iodine can be revealing. That's a serum test. But there's no connection between serum iodine and nutritional levels of iodine. So they're just not useful that way. And the last thing is, that was accuracy. The last thing is clinical utility. So the studies that I talked about regarding low iodine diets reversing thyroid function, If we were in a simple logical world, you could test anyone for their blood level and you could know in a moment if they had any possible benefit to to get by regulating iodine. If they were high, it would help them to go low. That would make sense. But the paper showed that when they would look at people before and afterward, those who got better versus those that didn't respond, the iodine levels didn't predict that. So there's no big utility that way. The one area where they have predictive value is those who do a low iodine approach And maybe they're three months out or six months out, they've been super thorough about it, and they're not responding. 
So in those cases, urinary iodine to creatinine ratio tests can help. They don't show their nutritional status, but they show their iodine excretion. They show how much they're detoxing. So if someone's been trying to go low in iodine for many months and it doesn't seem to help them, and you test them and they're still excreting a lot of iodine, it means one of two things. It means either they're missing some ongoing sources or they had some massive exposure in the past they've not caught up on just yet. Hmm. Do you, is one more common than the other? Um, probably the first, <laughs> but you They're know, the second, scenario, yeah. the second scenario, it's often predictable because someone will say, yeah, I was taking this mega dose iodine supplement for many months, or I was put on iodine drops for other, it's usually known in their history that they were on some massive dose. And is there anything that one could do if, for example, they were, is it just a time game? Pretty much. You know, there's some nutrients that give the body a little more tolerance and help a, a bit of buffering for that. Big thing, they're going to be selenium, yeah. zinc, uh, sufficient iron, you know, adequate vitamin A, beta carotene. But those things don't speed it up. It's more so their absence slows it down. So yeah, good good hydration, overall health, and then just, just time. Sounds like also a whole foods diet could be a benefit to make sure that you're getting some of those nutrients. You know, I, I didn't want to uh, go, I don't want to go too far off track because this is so valuable for the listener, but you did mention nutrient testing. And in a space of natural health, um, nutrient testing seems to be a big thing. I'm curious as to what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, um, I've I've been in the whole natural health world since the the mid nineties professionally. And I don't know, I, I love for, I love for there to be good data. I love to be objective, but I worked in a laboratory firsthand and it made me realize um, how tests are not perfect and how they're not always clinically relevant. They're not always reproducible. And one of the easiest things as a clinician to do over the years was just to, to, you know, do what we call a split test. So any new test I would consider doing on patients, I would just do a split test where I would check someone like myself oftentimes or a staff <laughs> member, and we would just run the test twice in the same sample of blood under different names. And if a test was, if a test could show pretty much the same results, even if it wasn't seemingly from the same person, that was, it could be worth thinking about further. further. That doesn't mean that there's still a lot of other questions to answer about clinical utility, whether it changes treatment outcomes, you know, there's many other things to think about. But if a test is not reproducible, meaning that if I pull two tubes of my blood and I put John Doe on half of it and, you know, me and John should get the same results. Right. <laughs> but Your other half, yes. There's, yeah, there's no need to proceed further. And sadly, I found that so, so many nutritional tests don't survive that simple benchmark. In keeping with the theme of this show, I'd like to thank one of the sponsors, Inside Tracker. And this is especially relevant today because Inside Tracker will allow you to look at all your thyroid hormones. It will allow you to look at your thyroid antibodies, things that we talk about in depth in this show. Right now, my listeners can get 20% off. Go to the insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyons store. That's Inside tracker.com slash Dr. Lion. And you can go ahead and order your blood work, be able to assess it, check out to see where your thyroid's at. If you're feeling tired, if you're noticing that your hair is falling out, perhaps you're constipated. There's a whole list of symptoms that go alongside with hypothyroidism that can be addressed, but you're never going to be able to address it if you don't know it. For a limited time, get 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. Just go to insidetracker.com forward slash Dr. Lion. That's insidetracker.com forward slash Dr. Lion. I, I've actually found the same thing. And uh, ideally, it would be amazing to have a multitude of tests to examine things that you know we find very valuable as a clinician. The question is, is it applicable to actual care and are these right. tests validated and you, you and know, i really I, high, high, yeah. go ahead no you and i i feel very much the same on these things yeah and in the recent past i've been realized too another consideration is that there, there's screening and diagnosis and screening has inherent problems working against it you know the more uh, the more you're looking at people that are probably healthy but you're seeing things that might be wrong the more likely anything you find is to be just artifactual you know, if, if a test has even like a 5% rate of a false positive, but if you're testing, you know, 50 things, 
you're going to see at least two or three false positives on everyone. That's just expected. So back early along in practice, to me, it seemed like a doctor was virtuous the more things they screened for because the more they would catch. But I've come to realize now, huh, that's a misguided idea. That The more things you screen for indiscriminately, the more random stuff is going to show up that's not relevant. And it doesn't uh, really tell the story of the patient. And uh, it's just, it's, it's almost a distractor from actually doing the simple things to get individuals better. You know, um, in terms of thyroid disease and treatment, their medication is an option. I'm curious to your perspective on the kinds of medication, also the way in which they can improve their efficacy of taking medication. You know, thyroid medication, it's one of the, the trickier medications to take because of absorption issues. Yeah, for sure. You know, even a higher level thought before that, there's been also a big change of perspective about what scenarios medications truly help. In almost in, in all scenarios, medications can change thyroid levels. And if we were in the logical world that we talked about before, someone could have abnormal thyroid levels and those could correlate with symptoms for sure. But then correcting those levels with medication would reverse those symptoms, would reverse those problems. We've come to learn that the one doesn't always follow from the other, that hormones your body makes, even if they're chemically the same as hormones you would take, the results are not the same. So we now know that of those who have who are on thyroid medication, a subset are don't have a thyroid. We call that athyrotic. Another subset had severe overt hypothyroidism. Their brain was begging their thyroid to do something, and it wasn't. It was just shutting down. There was like nothing coming out. So those two scenarios, the data is strong that, yeah, it's needed and they do better. Now, that second scenario, the overt hypo disease, that still can benefit by dietary change. And many of them may not need long-term treatment, but they can benefit from treatment at least temporarily. Now, it seems that if you encompass all of, all of medicine, somewhere around 85% of people on thyroid meds weren't from those categories. They had what we would call subclinical disease or suboptimal disease. And what's not intuitive is that the problem could have totally been associated with causing symptoms. It could have done the stuff we talked about, the fatigue, the weight gain. But there's also longer-term complications from that. That can cause, you mentioned, infertility. That can also cause cardiovascular risk. It can raise the risk of some cancers, you wouldn't guess, like melanomas. It can affect lifespan. So all that stuff can happen. But yet, in those 85% scenarios, the medications don't help. The data is clear that in those scenarios, medications do not help people lose weight. It doesn't help them regain energy. It doesn't cut all these risks we talked about, even when it normalizes the levels. So what is someone to do? How would they know? They try, They go on the medication. I, I was reading one of your, um, something, an article that you'd put out, and you were talking about a recent survey of 12,000 people, and they found that 80% of the people that went on medication, there was no improvement in symptoms. And symptoms, again, there's a fatigue, but also weight gain, hair breakage, um, gastric slowing, constipation. What is someone to do? What would be your first step? Well, in those, in those scenarios, we have data saying that 95% of people can improve their function via dietary change, you know, and lifestyle change. So that's, that's not just like a nice touchy-feely backup plan. That's like yeah. the one thing to do that really makes a big difference. <laughs> and when you say diet, you're talking about reducing iodine. Are there other things? And obviously uh, processed foods, reducing iodine. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. When I wrote my last book about uh, modulating iodine, most of the diets that were written about that were only meant for very short-term use. They were just meant for a couple of weeks before a procedure to make your thyroid iodine hungry, to uptake scan better or something. And that was fine. It was effective. But what I realized is that many who are using that to improve their thyroid health they would need longer. They would need months on end. And so in that context, you know, they should be on a healthy diet for other reasons as well. So yeah, so the thyroid, the one thing we know that makes a big difference is changing iodine. But the body, you know, there's more facets to health than just that. So you want a good overall diet. So all the things you'll talk about yourself with your other guests, those things still matter for many reasons. But the one, the one single variable that really makes it all thyroid specific is controlling iodine. You know, that's very innovative. And that was why I wanted to have you on and, and discuss these things, because I think it's really important to frame the conversation well, 
and come up with solutions to the best of our ability. And what I think that we find a lot in the medical field and really just in the health and wellness space is that things are repeated over and over again, whether they are correct or not. And eventually, if you hear someone say, take iodine enough, because <laughs> it's going to treat your hypothyroidism, which, you know, early on in practice, I saw all the time, you know, it, it becomes true. And even if it's not true, so it harms people unknowingly. Right. And it's something that seems intuitive because it, it, this is where context matters. This is where nuance matters. And I love how you share that with your listeners, because in the context of historical pediatric iodine deficient thyroid disease, iodine was life saving. You know, it's not the, it's not a bad guy. It's not a villain. We need it. But the fact of the matter is many people genetically don't tolerate it above some threshold and they may represent a quarter or so of the population, a quarter to a half. And we now know that somewhere between 30 to 40% of American adults are exposed to that unsafe threshold. So for many, that same advice doesn't apply. Yeah, no, it, it also makes me think if it's, if we have an issue with iodine, we likely have an issue with multiple other compounds that we don't even know about yet. Um, so I'm curious as to what those are going to be. When I, it think, comes to I think that's true. I'm sorry, just one super quick point. Yeah, but it is different in the sense that it's got a pump. So every other nutrient, the amount in your blood is enough for your tissues. But iodine, it's so exacting that the body pulls it in and then gates it off. So we really adjust how much there is of it inside this compartment. Because of that, a little bit too much is problematic in ways that just isn't true for others. So yeah, there's always more to learn, but this one is weird for a lot of reasons. That's good. That's actually really helpful. Um, you know, I remember reading a study on iodine and breast cancer, mm -hmm. um, you know, because there was a lot of women that were putting iodine on their, their skin and their breasts and, you know, whether it's absorbed that way or not, um, you know, it was just concerning. So it was something that I, I had read and it actually, it didn't, it had the opposite effect that I think people were going for. Have you read you any know, information on that? Very much so. And that comes up a lot. I'll tell someone about the benefits of going low iodine. And there's a popular view that iodine has some protective effects against breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And so many who are educated say, but wouldn't that be endangering my breast cancer risk? And so here's an area where we've hypothesized about that because of the observation that Japanese women have lower rates of breast cancer. They also have a higher intake of iodine. And so one could theorize maybe the one affects the other. But this has been looked at in better detail. And it turns out that that yeah, on traditional diets, the Japanese Okinawan women did have lower rates of breast cancer. But if we then separate them on high, medium, low iodine status, the higher their iodine status, the greater their risk of breast cancer is. And this has shown up among other populations, other ethnicities as well. We now know that there's, I mentioned that pump a moment ago, it's called the sodium iodide symporter. Because of reasons of shared embryology and also of reasons to regulate the iodine in breast milk, that iodine pump is also in breast tissue. And when a woman's not lactating, it's pretty much shut off. But in disease states, it can be activated. So fibrocystic breast disease activates that pump. Breast cancer is activated even more. And it turns out both of those disease processes can relate to the symptoms to the free radical damage from the extra iodine. Now, one, one more big paradox is that because of that pump, a high dose of iodine temporarily acts like a low dose of iodine. So you flood the body with it, you shut off the pump and none comes in. So for a while, we saw that women with fibrocystic breast disease, about two thirds of them could lower their symptoms by taking a high dose of iodine for a few months, then it quit working. And some thought they must have needed that, but others realized, oh no, they were just shutting off the pump for a little while. It's really fascinating. It's it, really the context is so fascinating. And, and I'm hoping this really makes the listener think if they're taking iodine, or if they have chronic uh, thyroid disease, a way to perhaps mitigate it, or at least try in a self contained way to make improvements. That brings me to medication. If an individual were to go on medication, and I believe that we actually have slightly different views in terms of medication, there are natural and synthetic. I'm curious, and I know the listener really is curious, is is there one that you prefer? So between the two, I don't like the nomenclature for starters. <laughs> it's the <laughs> nomenclature that there is. So I won't, yes, I won't try to change that. 
but this is how we divide those things. But so we have we have this natural hormone world, and normally hormone means estrogen. You know, when we talk about to the public, so natural hormones mean hormone replacement, and we think about bioidentical estrogen, progesterone. Bioidentical is equated with natural, and it means chemically identical. But all that stuff doesn't apply to the thyroid world, and I wish it would. It would be more simple. Right. So in the thyroid world, what we call synthetic is still bioidentical. It's still the same stuff the body would make. Uh, what we call natural is taken from a pig. It's a porcine sourced thyroid tissue, and that's that's used as a medication. In terms of preferences, people have different needs. There's no one thing that works best for everyone in, in this space, especially. When I practiced clinically, most who would come to see me had already tried various versions of the synthetic thyroid isolates. <clears throat> and I never thought they were they didn't work because they were bad in some way or because they were synthetic. But there's there's three hormones that are all pretty active. There's T4, T3, and T2. And some people have a hard time making those steps to make one out of the other. So synthetic hormones often depend upon the body taking them and then activating them as needed. But some can't do that. So many would do well on the natural. And I thought one reason was because it had all those things pre-made. But there's many that do better on synthetic T4, some that do better on combinations. So <clears throat> yeah, they all exist. And it just, would you say it's trial and error or do you prefer that individuals start with the <clears throat> more, uh, I suppose, porcine? We'll, we'll pretend we're not going to use natural versus synthetic, but porcine, <laughs> which is uh, T4, T3, and T2, because they synthetic or say the tyrosine or the T4, T3 does not have T2. You know, my views have evolved on this. So for quite a while, we had very good access to well-made, uh, very pure versions of natural thyroid. And it was cost-effective. It was consistently absorbed. And so I would use that more of as a mainstay back in those days. But those are less available at present. And also the data about the necessity and the benefit of thyroid medications has changed. Hmm. So more and more, when I think about someone, my first question is, do you need that in the first place? You know, do you need this long-term or not? And if you do, that's one thought process, but that's rather rare. Most people are in the category to where they probably don't need that long term. And it's not a matter of how can we tweak this medication to help you feel better. It's more so how can we make this stable as we're helping your body get stronger so you need less and less of it. And in those cases, I think about have they really optimized what they're already on? Are they on something that's reasonably well made, that's cost effective, that's consistently available? And if so, are they taking an amount that's appropriate for them? And are they taking it consistently? And if so, then I would be less apt to change that as I would to put more focus on helping them need less of that. So eventually de-prescribe by supporting mm -hmm. the body in other domains. Mm -hmm. And that's an exciting word. It's been used a bunch here lately in the thyroid world. So now that we know that the meds don't help that many people, the question has come up, what well, can they come off of them? You know, If they've been putting them unnecessarily, what are their odds of not needing them? And they've shown that if you do nothing smart, nothing strategic, but just take away medications on a schedule, that about a third of people have no problems. They get no symptoms and no changes in their thyroid levels. And that's true for those who were overtly as well as subclinically hypo. And then some studies have said, well, what if we do this cautiously? What if we look at people based upon what their personal output still is? And what if we try to control their iodine intake? And if you put the, do things in a more thoughtful way, they've shown that about 84% of people could take a lot less or none and do well from that, have no problems from that. <clears throat> you know, there's a one, obviously I won't mention her name, but I asked you about a patient and, and you taught me a very valuable lesson. It was about thyroid antibodies. And one of the issues that I've seen in clinical practice, well, really, it, it's twofold. Number one, a lot of times uh, antibodies resolve. You do the things that you're talking about. You get your lifestyle under control. You remove if there's any kind of autoimmune trigger or infection or something else happening. The thyroid antibodies, and really we're talking about anti-TPO and um, you know, antithyroglobulin. Anti yeah. yeah, and antithyroglobulin both can improve and often do. They go into essentially remission. And of course, there's, you know, a cyclical output of antibodies uh, depending on the individual. But one thing that I thought was really valuable and I hope really helps a listener is oftentimes thyroid antibodies don't necessarily relate to long-term health. 
That's often surprising. When they're extremely high, they can be factors for some symptoms, some health problems. But for many people, they're not at that extremely high level. And they're, the level of antibodies and the relationship that has between their likelihood of their thyroid improving or getting worse, it's nowhere near a type of relationship as we would think. Those that have the highest antibodies versus those that have the lowest, the nine-year risk of having your thyroid shut off from one category to the next, the difference is about 1% different. So your risk is like 1% lower over the course of nine years if your antibodies are through the roof or almost negative. Yeah. And, and I found that really valuable because as a clinician, I was chasing antibody levels and I wanted to see full resolution of the antibody levels. And you said to me, well, how is she feeling? And I'm like, oh, she's doing better than she ever has. She's <laughs> feeling great. She looks great. She's a great quality of life. And you said to me, well, Gabrielle, why are you chasing these antibody levels, they may not change for her and it is not indicative of her thyroid disease or a thyroid disease at this point. So I, I really thought that that was very valuable. In terms of medication, how can an individual, what are the steps that they can take to get the most out of their medication, just very practically? You know, a couple, a couple of thoughts. So one of which equates to how the medication is used. Another relates to how they're, they're being tested. Because in many cases, if they're monitored in ways that are not consistent. It can look like there's a problem with the medications when, when there's not. So you mentioned a bit about the first one, about timing with food and meals. We do have some newer liquid versions of thyroid medication, which might be able to be taken with meals for a lot of people, or at worst, 15 minutes beforehand. So for the regular ones on tablets, though, you definitely want an hour between your, your, your meds and your meal. And there is a circadian rhythm to thyroid hormones. We do make the bulk of them late at night or early in the morning. So taking it you know, once daily, first thing, is the closest approximation what the body would do by itself. Some will do bedtime. That can be reasonable as well. But you really want a solid hour with nothing besides water in your stomach to help the medicine go down. And then no coffee, right? coffee? Yeah. So for some people, if if you're doing great, if you're feeling well, your levels are stable, the coffee an hour later may or may not be a problem. But for some people, their levels are not stable. And in those cases, then we can think about the following hours. And there's been data saying that coffee or dairy products, even many, many hours after a dose may be a problem for some people. That's important. So rather than um, rushing to change the dosage, really make sure that you're having your medication on an empty stomach or really also reducing iodine-rich foods during that time or, and or dairy, coffee, any kind of food. Um, in terms of blood testing, do you recommend individuals test before they take the medication, after? Are there certain supplements that may affect the thyroid medication um, numbers that are maybe falsely elevating it or falsely yeah. decreasing it and, and hormones as well? Yeah, the last one, real easy one about the supplements. So just I encourage just taking a pill holiday for three days before your blood tests. Uh, anything with biotin, anything with probiotics, probably some other compounds as well, can skew thyroid levels. And that doesn't mean they're changing what's happening in your body. It changes what happens between your blood and the, the lab analysis. So yeah, giving yourself a break that way. Hormones, hormone therapies, if you're steady on one, not a problem, but if you ever start or stop or change a dosage, that will commonly cause a change in your thyroid levels. So it's good just to be aware of that and to expect it. Uh, before or after a dose, there's some really good doctors I know that sometimes will test after a dose on purpose, but that's the exception. The lab reference ranges for uh, T3, T4 especially are based upon a trough level, so the low point of the 24-hour cycle. And that correlates with where you would be before you've taken your pill for that day. So yeah, before the pill is taken. Uh, morning matters, so ideally 7 to 9 a.m. to fit the circadian window. The time of the menstrual cycle matters for menstruating women. So if you're between about day one being the first day of your period, if you're between about day nine and day 20, you may not get the reading the same as you would at another part of your cycle. So better to test during your first week or nine days or your last week before your period to compare that the most accurately. And then also meals can affect that. So yeah, first thing in the morning, fasting, um, no pills. So no supplements that day or two days prior, and then no thyroid meds that day. Another one of the sponsors is First Form. First Form, I love you guys. I love your products. 
They are incredible in terms of customer service. And when we think about protein, I often think about First Form. They offer a 110% money back guarantee. When it comes to nutrition, uh, this is an area that many people struggle, especially eating optimal amounts of protein every day, which we know is incredibly valuable. Uh, It is really difficult to get this for many people, which is why I love the Pure Whey Protein Isolate, which is formula, P-H-O-R-M-U-L-A dash one natural. I absolutely love this company. I have been working with them since 2018. I use all of their products. I give their products to my family. They are incredible in terms of coming up with cutting edge supplements, as well as if you like different flavors of protein powders, this is your place to go, whether it's pumpkin or chocolate or vanilla or velvet cake, whatever it is, you've got to check out firstform.com dot com slash Dr. Lion. That's firstform.com slash Dr. Lion, and you'll get 110% money back guarantee. You'll also get free shipping. And if you're up for it, even check out their workout clothes, which is what I train in. You know, as it relates to blood level testing, I, I know that we're getting close on time. The There's one relationship that seems to come up a lot And that is related to T3. And individuals will oftentimes, there's like this seesaw relationship between TSH and T3. And you've discussed it and you've taught me about it. I would love for you to share because oftentimes patients will look at their lab and they'll go, oh, you know, my my T3 is low. I need to add more. And then you'll see this subsequent uh, suppression of TSH, which is the brain connection to the thyroid. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm just getting a note here to you. There we go. Okay. Um, Yeah, so there's an inverse relationship, and it's true at the extremes. So when someone has no thyroid hormone, their T3 levels will get low. And if someone has like a massive overdose that includes T3, their T3 levels will go high, totally clear. And what's happened too is that there's been a lot of data showing how healthy thyroid levels are not always the same as normal thyroid levels. And T3 and T4 are are linear. The more you've got, the higher they are and vice versa. TSH is inverse. So the lower it is, the more you've got. And the higher it is, the less that you've got. And there's clear data that healthy people have a low TSH. So many in natural medicine have thought, well, if that's the case and there's this backward relationship, then healthy people should need to have high T3 levels. And based upon those premises, it's totally logical. But it's important to think things through and say, oh, you, you can start You can start with hypothesis, then you got to test that in the real world. So we can say, this makes sense intuitively based on those reasons, but is that true? So we've looked at people and they've been many good studies done that have taken people that are free of thyroid disease and said, you know, how do their levels compare to normal levels? And then also of those who have thyroid disease, those who have fewer symptoms, those who have fewer long-term health complications, how do their levels within a normal range compare to uh, higher or lower? And what we see there is, yes, what I said about the TSH, there's generally a lower normal TSH, but there's not consistently a higher normal T3. In fact, many papers have shown the opposite, that those that consistently have high T3 levels have worse health outcomes. Yeah. Uh, Again, very valuable. And you explained it so beautifully. Dr. Alan Christensen, my friend, thank you so much for joining me. I'm going to link where people can find you. You're such a great resource. Are you still doing office hours, by the way? I am. <laughs> so most most Mondays, yeah, like at three o'clock central these days, I jump on and take some questions that have come in and just talk about some some recent topic. And that, that'll be a little bit later on today. <laughs> okay. Amazing. And you have a very rich... Uh, and valuable website, which I'll link here. You've got many, many books. You have Adrenal Reset. You have the, the what was the, the iodine book? The iodine reset? Yep, the thyroid reset. Thyroid reset. And where else can people find you? You know, your link, drchristensen.com. You know, that's, where, that's the main center of things. But I've got to say, uh, I've, I'm always, always happy to, to talk with you. And you mentioned too about how Often people do just think about common ideas and like the the telephone game, the more it gets repeated. But, you know, you've done a great job thinking things through and looking at things in greater detail as well. And that's uh, there's there's 
everyone means well, everyone wants to make a difference, but people are busy. Not everyone has the time to really do that. Not everyone sees the importance of that. But of those who do, I think you can make just such a bigger difference and get, you know, things that are even more effective. So I'm just, I'm glad that you do that and always glad to, to be involved with what you're up to. I really appreciate your time, Alan, and I appreciate you. I cannot wait to share this with my audience. Thank you. <laughs> my pleasure.